Ladies and gentlemen, we have Brutus of the Barber Beefcake, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, the King of Hardcore, Mick Foley, and Terry Runnels. Welcome, welcome, one and all. So we have some legends in the house with us here. How exciting is this? Now we're all uh, we're all talking out here. Everybody here, huge, huge wrestling fans, and uh, to have some of the all-time greats here with us is such a, a great honor and pleasure for us. And uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, folks, because this is all about you and about getting your interaction with these uh, great legends. So if anyone has a question, throw up your hand. You can come up here and uh, ask something from these folks here. Really? You know what? Don't 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 jump though. I guess we're out of here. Okay, right. Come on up, Luke. Don't, don't everyone get up at the same time. Wait, wait, don't you? I want the mic, dude. I want to make sure. We get here. Let's go. Let's uh, questions for Terry. So when you started out, you were already working for WCW doing makeup. How was that transition going to an on-camera role? Um, uh, I got probably less sleep and just I had more responsibility. Um, it was. It was, I was such a greenhorn, like poor Terry Taylor having to put up with me and say to me, don't ever do that again, or oh my God, always make sure you do this. Um, I think I sent um, Rotundo back to WWF because he, <laughs> he couldn't handle my greenness, God love him. No, I mean, it was, it was, I had been in the business long enough to know, you know, how things were, and it was an honor for them to ask me to, you know, do that character and, and become that on air character so it was an easy transition to answer your question in long format <laughs> but without alexander york there's no marlena right well who knows maybe i you know marlena came to me after gold dust had just started so i don't know i'm going to get into a personal argument with terry at this point <laughs> <laughs> by the chairs <laughs> This man drove to Live Oak, Florida for our wedding. I'll I have did, you know. that's right, yeah, many years ago. We just realized today, it was like, wait a second, I met you in 89, right? She'd been there since 85, 30 years, 30 yeah. years, right? Crazy. Oh, 30 Crazy. years. And if any of you want good stuff on him, I've got it. I've got all the secrets. <laughs> all right. This is actually for all. With the rigors of the travel for the... Um, uh, the amount of towns that you went through, when you were actually close to your family and stuff like that, did you go and visit them just to relax, or did you actually go there and throw a soiree? Like, how would it happen, like, uh, in, in those times? Ted, you want to take a crack at that? I didn't really hear you well, but it was... So oh, you're saying, like, if a show was yeah, within so proximity? If was close to, to where your family lived, would you guys just go be with your family? Would you throw a soiree? Could you define a soiree? <laughs> well, you know, in, that, in, in, in regional wrestling days, when we did a lot of driving, uh, if we were in close proximity, I, I would say we would, you know, if I had the option, I'm not going to go spend another night in a hotel. I'm going home to be with my family. And... Uh, we had such little time with our family that, you know, uh, at least for me, you know, any time I could have with them, I'm not going to be sharing it with a bunch of guys that I'm on the road with all the time. So I'm not throwing a party or a barbecue. It's all going to be family time. And of course, when the, when the, with the WWF, WWE, uh, you know, I went from the regional wrestling to immediately going uh, on the road for three straight weeks, 21 days, 21 cities, and then I go home for a week. And the first day of your day off, you're going home. And the last day of your week off, you're going back to work. So you're actually only home five days out of every month. And uh, that was a real strain. Yeah. I'm gonna, I know uh, Ted talks with great fondness about his days with uh, Mid-South wrestling, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well. So, uh, we had a meeting when Bill Watts came to WCW and he had this rule where you had to stay till the end of every show, right? And so uh, uh, Nikita Koloff raised his hand and said, uh, uh, there you go, right here. 
Isabella, I understand the importance of staying to the end at every show, but uh, there are times when maybe we haven't seen our family in a couple weeks. We have a chance to catch a last flight on a Sunday. Uh, would you be willing to make exceptions under those circumstances? And Bill said, yeah, it's a tough business on families. Okay, any more questions? We got to go. <laughs> like, it was like he didn't even consider it. So it was, it was tough to get that family time in. Uh, there were people, I personally never extended another invitation after the number of people who invited my Super Bowl party in Atlanta in 1992 was zero. So, uh, but I always look forward to the instances like going to Harley races where Harley would have a barbecue oh, and they were great. And Terry was there the night that Owen dumped a whole bot bottle of the hottest sauce ever made into Harley's chili. Yes. <laughs> Harley was fuming, but, uh, you look really look forward to those times when people go out of their way to make you feel like you're at home even though you're on the road. But I personally yeah, have not had a soiree at my house <laughs> since uh, having uh, the Funk Brothers and a couple of the guys from Smoky Mountain over to my house in Atlanta. Although Terry Runnels was at my Halloween party yes, I was. in 1991. Yes, I was. That's right, Great Dakota friend. was uh, Dorothy from The Dorothy. Wizard of Oz. Yes, she was. Uh, Noelle Ruby was, uh, <laughs> yes, she had the ruby red slippers. No, my daughter Noelle was uh, bananas in pajamas, which she called Nana Jama. Yeah. Uh, I think they were both three at the time, they're, right? Yeah, they're three so years old. Yeah. 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 So there were times, but few and far between. I, I'll have to say, like my my mother and father divorced, and so anytime I would go home or be near home, if any of you've been through a divorce, you know you have to see extra people on this side, on that side. My mother worked very diligently and was great about not letting anyone near me, kind of giving me a little, yeah. um, you know, enclave of privacy. And um, my father, literally every freaking Tom, Dick, and Harry, I like, I would go home. He was like, well, uh, "Here's my pest control guy, and uh, let me introduce you to my son." And like, every, he invited people over to introduce to his daughter, and I just stopped going to the house. When I there you go. You had the Tampa thing going on, so. Yeah, well, we would, we would fly at, at any cost <laughs> over try, overnight. Like, to try, just try to stay in our bed for a night, two nights. I remember Greg and I had the belts. We did 100 days straight without a day off. But we did get to go through Florida, so we get to go home for one day. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things we, I think I, I think I could speak for everyone here that we love about conventions is the idea of being in the same town two and sometimes three days in a row, sometimes two and three nights in the same bed. That's like unheard of, you know? So, so do you like uh, set up a camp at that point? Oh, yeah. You're writing home like I'm never coming you back now. You take the clothes out of your bag, put them in the drawer. Oh, yeah. Oh, which, which, okay, now you guys, this is, I know it's had to happen to all of you. We. Went to so many different hotels. I mean, I, and I, I can remember like flying in, I kind of, we're in a rush, maybe the plane's a little late. I go to the hotel, I check in, you know, I go drop my stuff, I go work the show, I come back and I go to my room and the dang key will not open the door. And then I go back to the front desk and I'm, I'm yelling and they go, sir, <laughs> you're, in the wrong, you're in the wrong room. That's not the room we booked you in. So I was going to the room number of the hotel I was in the night before. <laughs> yeah. Back in the days before the key cards, yeah. when they actually gave you physical keys, Terry Funk used to keep all his keys. Then we'd go back to the town. He would just work on whatever door until it opened. <laughs> Yeah, we'll find a way to stretch it out. I thought you were the most ah, I know. I think it's more of a challenge for Terry. I've been known to <laughs> cut corners on the road, not treat myself too well. Come on over. Yeah, or actually, stay there. I'll come to you. I could use a walk. Yes, I'm going to address this to both Foley and DiBiase over here. Yeah, I got a lot of points. What can I say? I know that both of you worked uh, the United States and Japan. Uh, just curious, what is the difference would you say would be between fans? Are the fans more respectable in Japan, as I've heard, or are they more a little on the rowdy side, so to speak? Respectful? Uh, I mean, not respectable or respectful? Well, respectful to a certain Well, you know, I love the reactions. I think Ted worked over there more than I did. Um, but I love the idea. There was a story with me and Terry, you know, having a great match in uh, Japan in January 95 left us both a little worse for the wear. 
And it was a small crowd, but they were all hovered around Terry, you know? And then I heard Terry's voice going, Cactus, where are you? And I said, Terry, I'm here, Cactus. He kept saying respect, and the fans would hover around so that when we hugged, they all went like, whoa, you know, like in the appreciation, like in unison. And then Terry whispered in my ear, hi, I'll drive me. <laughs> and, and when I pile drove him, they all went, whoa, in, in unison. So yeah, there was like bursts of clapping and then waiting. It was a different type of reaction, but it, yeah, it, it, was, it was very different, but I, uh, I appreciated both reactions. It's evolved. And, and I, it's it's yeah, evolved, though. Yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty, I would pretty, far. pretty much agree with that. It's like, you know, I, I was kind of, the, like when I went to Japan, I was, gosh, 22 years old the first time, and it was like the most you would ever get out of that audience was a very polite, I mean, not even a, not a, yeah, yeah, it's a very soft clap, and that was like, that, and that was their reaction. You could hardly, now, my understanding is that as more and more time has gone by, they, they've become more westernized. Yes. I don't know that they're throwing ice cups and stuff at you, <laughs> like, you know. And I think in 1991 was the first time I went, and a fan uh, came up to Dynamite Kid, and Dynamite punched him in the nose. And the fan went, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think those days are over where it was considered a badge of honor to be punched or hit right. by someone. But you work with Hanson, right? Oh, yeah. I, I was, that I was, and... Yeah, I was, uh, when, when Bru Bruiser Brody went over to the other company, to New Japan, um, and this was just prior to my coming to the WWF, um, Stan came in and he says, uh, Brody's gone over to the other side, which is pretty much at that time unheard of. Loyalty is huge in Japan, and he says, I need a new partner. Are you interested? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. I said, is a pig's ass pork? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, I became partners with Stan, and um, Stan would, you know, it's like the best way to the, go to the ring with Stan, because once he takes his glasses off, can't see. he can't see, yeah. you know. He is to just get behind that. him, and he's swinging. He was swinging that rope with the cowbell on it, you know. And you weren't sure whether it was going to hit you yeah. or somebody else. Uh, and there was times when he'd throw that lariat, and I'd be holding the guy, and he'd get both of us. <laughs> uh, but I mean, but, but the fans. I mean, he would he would go, and he would just like he would go, and the, the chairs would just scatter. And the other person that had that uh, was Andre, because people would try to take constantly they, taking pictures, taking pictures, taking pictures. You know, and it's, he, Andre had been known to snatch a camera and, and just, and bam, and smash it, you know, break the, and they, that was like, if you were a fan Ooh. and Andre the Giant destroyed your camera, wow, that was a big deal. Ooh, yeah. Like, I, you know, I can't explain it, but they were different. Well, we'll give it a try. Someone go come by my table, I'll smash your camera. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see if it has the same effect, all right? <laughs> I can stab your camera. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I can kiss your camera. Uh, I'm going to Terry's table. <laughs> Just a question for Mick there. Um, I'm sure you get this one a lot, so I apologize for the redundancy in the answer you might give. But um, mentally and physically, you look very healthy. And uh, I was just curious about like all the stuff that you've put yourself through in the ring, like your life now, is there anything that you struggle with? Um, Walking. Yeah, I had my, <laughs> I had my uh, hip and had my hip and knee replaced two years ago. Not at the same time, but a few months apart, and that took an enormous uh, amount of pressure off me. I was walking so badly, oh, actually difficult just to watch me. And if I was at one of these conventions, I really wouldn't get up. Didn't matter if I had a long line or no line. I'd be there for the duration, and now I get up just for just about every uh, interaction. Now, some of the stuff I did could correctly be labeled stupid. Uh, it turned out the mandible claw, yeah, that's it, I caught it. You lose a body part here and there. Uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative that uh, people still come and line up, and now the phenomenon is that 40% uh, of the people are families with children who were not alive when I was working actively, but nonetheless know the matches. And I didn't foresee any of that. So I'm lucky, A, that I am doing as well physically and mentally as I am. I do these one-man shows, uh, one in 
on Thursday in Tilsonburg, and yes, you know, Ted's, Ted's done a few something. Uh, yeah, you know, we do, we do make money, and uh, you do get up there, and you have the feeling of performing, but uh, Chris Nowinski, who co-founded the Boston Center for Traumatic Encephalopathy, and as long as I can say the words yeah. traumatic encephalopathy, I think I'm okay. But he said, yeah, when you get out there, it's like mental gymnastics, because you're, uh, you're creating stories, you're memorizing some stories, you're working off the crowd, and so uh, I get out there and do these things that are good for my mind, and uh, you know, I gotta get back into the DDP yoga. But all in all, yeah, I think uh, all things considered, I'm doing a lot better now than I was 10 years ago. So uh, yeah, yeah, so I'm pretty happy. I like, I like your question. I wanna ask the same to Brutus. You look really great, and considering what you've been through, what what ails you now, based on your your situations? Yeah, you, you guys think I'm hardcore. Brutus almost lost his entire face how many yeah. years ago? Uh, 1990. 1990, yeah. So yeah, that was the broken. big comeback. Yeah, the parasailing accident, right? You're looking at a walking miracle. <laughs> I ain't lying. Uh, that was one. <clears throat> The, the doctor said I, I wasn't going to walk away from. And luck, it's lucky for me, this, this doctor from Armenia, so hard-headed, so stubborn, he made up his mind he was going to save my life, and he did. And I just blew everybody's minds. And uh, it turned out pretty good for me. And I, I actually couldn't even sleep laying down for months, right? Like, had eight to sit months. up. Eight months. Couldn't lay down. How are you now? Doing good, man. I mean, you know, aches and pains. We burning a candle at both ends with, with a flamethrower. <laughs> it's a, it goes quick, but you know, it's not the age; it's the mileage. Now, does is, is that something that ever changes with any any of uh, you when you're when you're working? Do you ever get that slow down period? Now, I, I know you're all retired, but in your other aspects and lives, where the, writing a book or um, doing uh, speaking uh, engagements or whatever it is, do you, do you go at it with the same vigor you did for the wrestling career? Do you find that it's everything you do in life is the same? I try to go all in, you know. And I, uh, yeah, when I, you know, I remember uh, everything was going well when I did the 20 Years of Hell tour, the uh, 20 commemorate 20 years since that cell match. Then I got hired with one day's notice to do both a convention and a show in Chicago. So even the people who were coming up to, to me in line didn't even know there was a, you know, one of my shows going on. So I asked Kane if he would be my guest, you know, do the Q&A with me. And we, we go to approach it and I was, he was like, how many people are gonna be there? I said, there might be, you know, 10, there might be 500, I don't really know. We opened up the door, it was a lot closer to 10 than there was 500. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was so happy because now I had a, a, like a bad experience to talk about. Yeah, there's nothing interesting about to me. Nothing interesting about talking about the time we sold out this arena and had this great match. I'm interested in the time no one was there, the match fell apart. Like to me, those are the good stories. But uh, I, I remember uh, get I when I would make my comeback matches, I would need to take like a real jolt to get me into character. So I find that if I can get into like 1997 Mankind and tell a story in character, it really brings me into the moment. And I remember doing this thing, talking about an interview I did with Jim Ross, and I'm, and I'm halfway through the Mankind, uh, you know, imp impression or whatever, you, and I look at one of the women and she's just looking like this, like, she got her mouth open. I said, you didn't think I was bringing my A game, did you? And she said, honestly, no. I was like, oh, I don't care how many people are here. I'm always bringing my A game. So. I try my best, whether it's at a table, you know, with a fan to make it a good experience. And when I'm out there, uh, you know, doing my shows, whether it's a good turnout or bad. And some people know I, uh, let me see some kids in here. I uh, yeah. help out. <laughs> I, I'm an ambassador uh, in a red suit. And I do my, really, my very best when I have those experiences as well. <laughs> there you go. You know, uh, along the same lines, yeah, I, you know, even though I'm not, you know, I'm not, I've had both my knees replaced, two surgeries on my neck. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, the, the doctor that did my knees, he said, what, what do you drive? I said, a Ford F-150 pickup truck. He says, well, you won't be jumping out of that 
<laughs> that truck anymore. Not you know, if, you, if you do, he says you, you'll you'll ruin your knees. But uh, I'm in much better shape now. You know, I mean, I, I got real heavy for a long time uh, because of my knees. I was like looking for a place to sit down. You know, I front up my feet for more than 15 minutes, and so I've lost a lot of weight. And it wasn't DDP yoga, but <laughs> that wouldn't be bad either. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I need to do a little stretching, so maybe I should uh, call DDP. Uh, but yeah, I've tried to keep going. Uh, you know, I don't, maybe it's you know, maybe it's 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 habit. It's what you're used to. It's what you do. Uh, but again, it's like like uh, Mick said. Uh, where the business came, you know, I mean, I grew up in it, my dad did it, and, 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 and I remember my dad saying this, and he wasn't talking to me, I was just privy to a conversation he was having. He said, whether there's 10 people in that building or a thousand people in that building, I'm going to give the 10 the same match I would give the thousand. He says, because they paid their harder money to, to do it, and they are the ones who weathered the storm to get there, so they even deserve it more than the, than the others might. So I've always remembered that, and that's what I've tried to do. I to, to tag onto what he's saying. Um, I'm a big proponent of of. Um, it's okay. Can you guys hear me? You can hear me. Yeah. Can you hear? Um, of of like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so, my thing is, whenever anyone's at the table or at the show or whatever, that's their experience. And if you treated the 50 people before that one and you had eye contact with them and you engaged with them and then all of a sudden you are not present for that one person. I mean, that's their experience. And they leave you going, you know, what a dud. And I just hate when people spend their time, their money and their efforts. Yes. I, I may speak for all of us at the table. I think the best way to see that for yourselves is to visit us at our tables and make a purchase. <laughs> And see if we were waiting for that away, cheap pop. Uh, feeling like it was a worthwhile experience. Man, you're sounding like the million dollar man now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the laugh, is it? And I was trying to be so genuine. Thanks, Mick. <laughs> hey, Ron, I am a huge fan of the, uh, the Hall of Fame, and I'm waiting patiently for you, Terry, to be inducted because uh -huh. you put in the time and effort. And I think you deserve it more than a lot of the divas who have been inducted past it. Have only put in a short amount of time Thank you. so I that's that. that's to you but i want to ask you guys when you found out you were being inducted in the hall of fame how did you find out phone call personal visit can you tell us a quick story about that uh, i don't know about everybody else but yeah i got a I got a phone call from the office and uh, you know i was told that you know that, that you know the powers that be had uh, selected me for induction that year and, and again, it's like, uh, you know, you enter the Hall of Fame, it's, um, you look at other people that have gone before you, and a lot, a lot of people that have gone before me were people when I was young that I looked up to and admired, and, and to know that I've been included in that, that group uh, is, is very humbling. Uh, and, you know, and of course, yeah, I mean, obviously, it makes you feel good because you you know you feel like you know like all the all the hard work and the miles and all that I put into this have, have, have paid off. So, yeah, very appreciative. Uh, for me, uh, I had been an ambassador for WWE uh, for a little while, and on December 26th, 2013, 2012 rather, I brought my children to the uh, house show at Madison Square Garden. As long as they were still interested, as long as I had that pull, you know, I was going to bring them wherever they wanted to go. And Triple H asked if he could talk to me. And on the way to the office, I honestly thought he was going to tell me that I was, you know, fired as an ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> and I was preparing myself. I had to say, hey, thank you for, you know, the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And he goes, uh, Mick, uh, we'd like to know how you would feel about being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. I went, feel pretty good about it, yeah. <laughs> and so it was, it was a really, uh, I made up my mind, I didn't, wasn't gonna make a fuss over where I went on the card. I was actually lucky that I went first. Um, some of you know I have a son who's on the autism spectrum and if I'd gone on later in the card, those things can 
uh, run a while, especially if Hillbilly Jim is being inducted. Uh, <laughs> and so I was able to go out and see my family looking fresh. And uh, if I'd gone out there late, uh, you know, the family wouldn't have been there. So it was really a, a great night for me and a big honor and uh, something that I'll always appreciate. Brutus? That was a great night, yeah. That was a super night. Yeah, it's, you know, being on the road so much and, you know, spending that quality time with your family and your friends and really miss it, you know, 40 years I've put on the road or more and being away all the time and stuff. So, <clears throat> I treasure that time at home now, like, live every minute. Just relax sometimes and just don't do nothing. Just, just no motion. Because <laughs> I'm in motion forever. It's like, stop the motion. So, that's my theory. There you go. <laughs> um, so, we got time for two more questions here. Okay, I, got, I already got you here and I got you there. Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, this question for all of you guys. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, how was it? Uh, a, how were you guys able to adjust after being in the business of being in the, ha, doing your careers and having to be able to adjust after the life of being in WWE in the business? He's asking the transition. Like, like the transition. After you left, how how hard, easy? How was it for you? What's, li what's life been like for you after uh, the wrestling business, after retirement? Oh, after the business? Yeah. Any big adjustments for you? Big time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm getting on an airplane every day. You know, yeah. having real vacations, <laughs> going fishing, you know, beach. You, and you getting more uh, privacy in your retirement than you did when you were uh, a superstar? Yeah, absolutely. Get whatever you want. Amazing. Well, uh, one thing that has not changed for me, and that is I still pack everything and the kitchen sink because god forbid someone need me to perform brain surgery and i don't have all my tools and and surgical things so um that hasn't changed i love it's a luxury to fly to events like this and know that you're not going to have three or four more backpacks like you get to enjoy the people your friends see everybody again and then I'm going home, so it's that that's a joy, and there are other ways that I think it was not so much of a, a of an easy assimilation back into civilian life. Um, you know, there are ways that we get spoiled. You know, the limo here, the private jet there, kind of makes you hate flying commercial. You took <laughs> private jets. Stop it! Come on, I've been on Vince's plane no, once. No, no. Once. I didn't anyway. know you were that close with Rick. <laughs> Were you not on the plane ride from hell? No, I wasn't there. Oh, no. God. I know the one you're talking about, though. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah. So. <laughs> okay. uh, look, my goal is not to be on the list of greatest wrestlers. My goal is to be on the list of greatest ex-wrestlers. So uh, uh, the two things I missed the most when I got out of uh, WWE and wrestling full-time were uh, long drives, which I actually liked, and uh, seeing the, the children from Make-A-Wish and different organizations. And so one of the best moves I made when I got into wrestling is I just started cold calling uh, uh, organizations that I wanted to volunteer for. So Paul Newman's Hole in the Wall Gang uh, camp. Uh, there was a American Red Cross uh, did a camp for, uh, uh, or American Cancer Society for children with uh, cancer and their siblings and I just got involved in a lot of good groups and I made it a point to volunteer twice a week every week and I did that for 10 years so I've, I've fallen off but uh, I really admire the people who make the most out of what they've done and I put Ted on that list and Ted you know has, has preached a good word for many years and uh, turned people's lives around and uh, so I hope when there is such a list compiled that I can be on it. Mick Foley one of the greatest ex-wrestlers of all time. <laughs> uh, you know, and like, like Mick said, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I call it, I even have a message entitled, Legend versus Legacy. I said, I don't really care to be remembered so much as a living legend of professional wrestling. I, I would rather be remembered as a man who left a lasting legacy for his children. 
that uh, that when I'm gone, that my my boys can, you know, uh, you know, stand there over my casket and say, you know, my dad was a good guy, and you know, he wasn't just a wrestler, but you know, he gave back to the community. He went out and he tried to help disadvantaged kids and and started a ministry and, and uh, you know and left something worthwhile. Um, and I have found that um, uh, that by giving more of myself has brought greater joy to me than anything that, that wrestling ever gave me. So I like that. There it is. And I got that last picture just in time to get the last question of the evening here. And we promised you, come on over, buddy. I don't have enough uh, length for There's you. A lot of, lot of pressure here. Yeah, <laughs> this has got to be a good By one. going last, so you are declaring. Yeah, I've been like mauling it over for a week. Okay, so, better like, be good. It's something I want to ask. So clearly, a lot of hey, pressure. Guys, you guys look awesome. Lots of life. Lots of pressure okay, on you. <laughs> uh, so we are all aware of about your uh, different masterpieces or the type of matches that you put on within all your careers. But uh, my question is, has there ever been a match that you guys have passed off on uh, or has been like in rumblings in the backstage area that you guys, um, uh, how do I word it? Um, you, you've like had a, a whole Russell week, you said. You've had a whole week to think of Yeah, I know, I know. And now it's just like, whoop, gone. Um, <laughs> so like, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. I got that. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Um, so, like a WrestleMania match that uh, you guys possibly wanted to take but didn't, or uh, say like a championship match, like you're going to win this title and then it didn't happen. So, was there a, any point in time that there was a match that you really wanted to do and didn't? And just, yeah, uh, uh, I wanted to headline uh, WrestleMania against The Rock two years ago, and that didn't happen. <laughs> two, so, years, <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> 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 yeah, the other, no, I don't know. I was pretty fortunate to have some you know, big matches. Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of one offhand. You know, I would have loved to have wrestled Hogan just so I could have done it, you know. Uh, I got in there and did a couple interviews with him in Impact Wrestling, and if someone claims it's not a big idea to be in the ring with him, they're not lying to the audience, they're lying to themselves. And I was thinking, geez, you know, how can I can have a pretty good match? I'm not saying it wouldn't have been methodical, you know. We could have told the story, though, and uh, yeah, I wish I'd be able to do that. Uh, but uh, all in all, I got more than my share of good matches, so no complaints. Awesome. That is the worst final question I've ever had. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any, you know, WrestleMania match that I, you know, I, I, number one, I wouldn't pass on any WrestleMania match. If you offered me a WrestleMania match, I'm going to take it. But uh, there's a few guys that, you know, I've always been asked, you know, if there's one guy that you could have had a like a program with and you know what we call a program where it was like you know well the old school program now they don't last more than a month but right. where you wrestle a guy and you have a story an ongoing story you know and and that one guy w was here and left now uh ricky steamboat is one of the greatest wrestlers that, that we've ever had and i only I only had I had one match with Ricky Steamboat, Mike, and in, in, in my in our entire career. We were talking about that the other day, and and the match we had was you know was memorable. And I just thought, man, if we could have had that opportunity, so that would have been my guy. Can I just Brutus? Can I repeat the story about Montana just from yesterday? How many were at the beer uh, have a beer with a wrestler? It's a pretty good little story, right? <laughs> we're at a minor league baseball stadium in Montana and the idea is uh, the two bad guys are supposed to be putting me in peril, threatening me and I've got backup, you know, I've got Brutus. <laughs> oh yeah, I, maybe I'm not in a position to take you guys on, but I know someone who is and all of a sudden Brutus' music plays. We're at home base, you know, there's like a little sliver, a little pie section of fans, you know. We're at home base and out of the center field clubhouse comes Brutus. <laughs> It takes him three turns of his music to finally get to the ring. <laughs> and it's like eight minutes go by, right? These guys could have killed me twice over and said they're like, no. <laughs> and sometimes you just have to love it when you can say only in professional wrestling, you know, for the good and the bad. It's, uh, man, there's nothing quite like it. But uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with your question. It doesn't. <laughs> I just got such a kick out of reliving that visual. He's coming in with the shears. 
<laughs> the crowd's cheering and the guys have to, for eight minutes, had to beg off. It was, oh man, I love it when bad things happen, yeah. <laughs> to good people. <laughs> well, it's all you. Do you, have, do you have a last one that you wish you would have done? You, you get to finish us off there, Bruce, Brutus? I wouldn't have done or wish oh. I would have done? Yeah. Would have. Yeah, what's the one that you wish you would have done? Or done again? <laughs> oh, uh, I worked a uh, match with uh, Kurt Hennig. Oh. In uh, West. <laughs> and it was West Virginia or something, one of the wheeling two, three towns we always hit. This crowd wasn't real big, it was probably five, six thousand, so decent. And they put me and Kurt on. They had, I forget what other matches it was, you know, the title match or something. They put me and Kurt on like first or second. And, and but we were having good matches. We had the place go crazy in the first match or something, the second match. And it was like, and then the people just went the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the agents were, were hot. They said, these guys. Jeffrey, that again, freaking kill the show. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we tore the house down. Perfect was flying double flips over the over the top rope. You know, we went 30 minutes, and then just <laughs> hey, nobody could follow the match. Wow. <laughs> Kurt was just so amazing. And then we got the last one here, just because I I can see um, Flash Gordon looking at us here, <laughs> ready to come in here. Ready to go? So I'll make it fast. Yeah, it fast. Terry. So. I never trained to be a wrestler. That was not my thing. I loved being a manager and loved taking bumps from the guys. Did not ever want to wrestle. And when Vince thought this would be a good idea for me to become a wrestler, I would literally get to, to the arena that day and pray to the good Lord above and every other entity I could possibly call on, that please don't let me be wrestling today. And if I got there and found out, indeed, I was having to wrestle another girl, I knew what that meant. That meant go to catering and get your ass in the ring and learn something that you have to perform in a few hours in front of millions and millions of people. And it was the most terrifying thing. I don't know the number of times I threw up in the bathroom, like up in the arena, I just sicked my stomach. So every match was a match that I didn't want to do. <laughs> 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 but there was a lot of great matches there. Um, folks, have you had a great time here? Heard some great stories. Awesome. Let's show these people some love. Let's stand up. Legends of Wrestling, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, Hardcore Legend, Mick Foley, Terry Ronald, and the Barber Brutus, the Barber Beefcake. Thanks so much. Everybody. Thank you.